All right, welcome everybody to our Rewind and Play panel. Um, we're here to unpack the, um, the film that we just saw and have a discussion, what we witnessed, um, put some things into perspective and, and into context. And I am excited to have four amazing panelists here today. I'm just going to give a short introduction to everybody. Um, in green, in the green shirt, we have Lachelle Antonia Gray here. Lachelle Antonia is currently um, one of the outreach managers for Hunger Free Vermont, and she also works for the Creative Discourse Group. Uh, welcome, Lachelle. Thank you for joining us from Burlington today. Um, we have Alisa Swindell on the very end here. Um, she is the Associate Cur Curator of Photography at the Hood Museum of Art at Dartmouth College. And she is an art historian uh, with primary areas of interest are um, history of photography and other modes of contemporary art with a focus on US artists, race, and sexuality. And we have Taylor Ho, Ho Bynum here, who is a musician, teacher, writer, with a background including work in composition, performance, interdisciplinary, collaboration, production, organizing, and advo uh, advocacy. And you are the um, director of the Dartmouth um, Jazz Orchestra, the, uh, the coach. Coast. It's the coast, sorry. <laughs> And uh, we have our very own Jordan Fitch here, um, Jam Community Engagement Producer. Uh, they are, interestingly, behind the camera right now, recording this talk, as well as being in front of the camera, being part of this talk. It's all very meta here. Oh, my phone. It is very it's meta. Very meta. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Let's jump right in. So, you know, how did y'all feel about the movie? What what happened when you watched that movie? What what what, what came up? I I can start. Um, I mean, a lot of things came up, um, but interestingly enough, and what I don't think I expected was watching this film the way it was shot and edited it really made me feel like I was watching an episode of the Eric Andre show. Um, and for those of you, like, if, if you don't know what that is, it's a, like, a, a talk show hosted by this comedian, Eric Andre and Hannibal Buress. And, like, the conceit of the show is to, like, bring a celebrity guest on and, like, make them cripplingly uncomfortable. Like, that is the point of the show. And, like, he, you know, and it's crazy, and he's... A funny guy and he'll do the most to like get that to elicit that response and just like make the person he's bringing in just absolutely cringe and like a lot of them leave or like will walk off the set because they don't know what they're getting into but the part that I don't know for this film that really just like got the gears going and there were just so many layers to it was that unlike Eric Andre like that was not the point of you know the initial like television show I forgot what it was called like a evening of jazz or whatever they were filming and what we watched which was again so many layers but like another person's interpretation of that footage neither of them yeah like the intention wasn't to create discomfort but that's what I felt and that's what you saw because like that was the just actual experience of Thelonious like in this space and I think just I don't know of what it feels like to be in I guess like white spaces or in like that gaze. I don't know if that made any sense. Uncomfortable, but not in a funny way on purpose. Yeah, I thought it was interesting because they seem, I mean, he's, he's the subject of the show, but they seem to have no interest in him. Mm. Like everything is going on and no one comes over to him, no one's talking to him and, except to tell him what to do. And like everything's happening around him. And I think we do sometimes forget how long it takes to produce things like that. Um, you know, you, when the, they focus essentially on him and he's sweating. And like, he's been sitting under these lights for hours, playing again and again and again. And everyone else basically like got up and moved around and he's just sitting under these hot lights doing something that takes a lot of physical labor. Um, and so, yeah, he is sweating by the end, but they're, the way they fixate on it, 
um, is extremely uncomfortable. But yes, this idea that they're sort of moving around him. Like you just think of someone famous now and how you expect to, if you see a show being done, that they're sort of fawning over them. That everyone's making sure they have a drink and that they're like, you know, that someone comes to wipe the sweat away and things like that. And he's just there. I felt similarly. I love the Eric Andre. Because uh, <laughs> that, that's exactly, I, I was like, why is it about this that just makes me want to like just scratch my eyes out? <laughs> I think it's very much that feeling of like, they're putting him in this space and, and claiming to adore and appreciate and really respect what he does, but they're just walking around him and just kind of like staring at him and he's aware and I think that's what makes it the most uncomfortable for me is there's this feeling as if they think that like he doesn't know what's going on he's not aware that something about this is off but he's so fully aware to the point where it's at one point he's like I let's just go have dinner I'm hungry I'm tired I literally have a show after this I wasn't planning on like putting on a private performance and yet they're like, no, no, one more song, and, and, and maybe not. And so it's, yeah, it's just, um, I can't imagine that happening to someone now. And it makes me think of whatever mega stars we have now who are like, I don't do interviews. I, I'm not going out in the public. I'm not doing that anymore. I, I found it, it's interesting, I just finished teaching a jazz history course where so much of the point of it was trying to get my students to understand you can't understand or appreciate the history of jazz and black creative music outside of the larger economic and cultural context. Mm -hmm. And I feel this film summed it up in an extraordinary way because it's not only do you hear, what I really appreciated about the film is that like 20 minute segment of just Monk playing the shit out of the piano, you know, and just like, demonstrating why he is one of the most important musicians of the past century, and then to see that juxtaposed with the bullshit he has to go through in his daily life as a musician on tour, as a black man in Europe or in the United States trying to make his work, as someone who was, you know, different, <laughs> as one cannot deny, um, but to see what he has to go through to make his music, I feel, makes the brilliance of that music all the more powerful, but also is so much within the history of that music. I mean, what's scary to me is having been inside of this music. You say you couldn't imagine a celebrity happening this night right now. I've, like, I've been in situations on tour with Cecil Taylor, with Anthony Braxton, with Bill Dixon, with some of the people who are my greatest heroes in this music in exactly the same situation, still in the 90s, in the aughts, in the teens. You know, It's not like it's changed. I think it's this music exists in this periphery between art, folk, classical, whatever, so it never, it's, you know, the fact that Monk had to go through that to make his music happen, I feel it says so much, but is so much part of the history of the music. I mean, we, Duke Ellington's first big break was playing at the Cotton Club, which was a segregated club in Harlem where he was hired to play quote unquote jungle music. Mm -hmm. And out of that context, Duke Ellington made some of the most extraordinary music of the past century. And the fact, and to see that, to see Monk in that same kind of position, making art of such transcendence, and also of such humor and tricks, like the, his tricksterness. I don't know if anyone caught the last two songs. He, he plays all original songs until the last two, when he plays Don't Blame Me and Nice Work If You Can Get It. I mean, that's hilarious, <laughs> you know? Like, that's Monk just being like, this is what I can control, and I will control it, and the rest of y'all are doing your thing. But I just found that, that, that storytelling is was quite powerful I thought it was and I think um, thank you for all the uh, comments and the storytelling was interesting but also uh, unconventional and, and it was just archival footage and the footage spoke for itself there was no commentary there there was no guidance there uh, and I think that you know the footage was created wasn't intended to shine a light on the practices uh, of, of these white spaces and the, uh, the the lack of appreciation they have act for the actual artists you know um, so uh, maybe that's a question more for uh, Jordan and and Alisa but I was wondering about the archive comment across um, you know a, a footage like this um, I mean just having seen Thelonious Monk play you know his uh, his brilliance it was always like a, a moment of refuge you know among all this bullshit 
Um, but it was for every uh, music lover, it was an absolute treat to see him like that, and we haven't seen that before. So I was just wonder about um, the role and impact of a surprising archival find like this, and, and what it means for us now, now sitting here talking about it, you know, shining a light of practice that had happened in the past, but as you said, still ongoing, right? Um, I think what's so important about finding archival material like this and bringing it to light, and that's the important part, bringing it to light, not letting it, don't stuff it back in the box. <laughs> like, oh, we're not gonna talk about this. Um, what you said about the history and how you could possibly like take weeks off your class if you just show this film right now. <laughs> um, cut down that syllabus. Because it is telling so much of the difference between the mythology of France's appreciation for black artists and for jazz and the realities of it. Um, you know, when he talks about his face is put on the magazine, he is, you know, shown as the, the star coming in, but then he gets the least amount of money and the least amount of support of everyone playing the festival. And when he brings that up, and that's his memory of his first time playing in France, which is what they keep asking, but what they're trying to get at is why was your music so different? But that's not the question. The question is about what was it like to play in Paris that first time in 1954? And he's like, well, this is what it was like. Well, that's not nice. Um, that's not a nice thing to say, but now that's in the archive. And what I'm sure you got in jazz portraiture once it was aired was something that seemed very different. That version of, you know, when you see at the end where basically he's playing while the man talks about him over the music, it's probably more what people saw on their TVs. Um, and so that's what comes back is that, well, what was it actually like? What was the story? What was the real history of this? And that's what we get in these things where you have hours of footage and you take it down to like a 20 minute segment to air on television and that difference in that stories that we're then able to tell when we're able to see all of that background material. I mean, anyone who's worked in the archive, when we, we try and take things from other people and I'm like, ooh, you have a napkin that someone wrote this on like five years ago? And they're like, I don't even know why that was stuffed in my pocket. But I'm going to throw it. I'm like, don't you dare throw it out. And everyone's like, why, why do you want the napkin? And I'm like, do you see who wrote on that? Like these two people were sitting together and we know that they were at this bar at this time and wrote this stuff together, which led to whatever amazing thing. And those are the, the detritus that we collect. Um, and that's like... But then that detritus tells a story that often has been hidden. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I think what you, like, just as someone who often in my job is getting so much footage and then, you know, condensing it, it, it a lot of, it is different what people are seeing versus kind of that whole story. And I think, again, like you said, I think it's important that when we do uncover these archival things, it's important not to stuff it back because we do get that added layer of, of, of history. And I think that that can be really impactful in many different ways. The example that's coming to my mind, I um, watched Summer of Soul um, a while ago, which is kind of similar circumstances. They just found a bunch of archival footage from, um, what was it, the Harlem Cultural Festival, which is something that Lots of people don't, like, I didn't know that it happened until I watched the film because it happened the same year that Woodstock happened. And so Woodstock got all the, the press. Um, but then they re released the, or they found the archive footage and, um, oh God, what's his name? The Questlove made a, an incredible documentary, which, you know, you got just, one, there was the layer of being able to see, like, all these incredible artists just put on an absolutely fantastic show. But then something that I took like really personally or like learned was that at that performance, at that concert, they needed like security for the, you know, cause it's a huge festival, but they didn't want to have the police force involved. So what they did was they had the Black Panthers come and provide all of the, um, you know, bodyguarding and security for that performance and that just like, like awoken something in me and like gave me a new like perspective on things that are like a new way for me to handle like, I don't know, situations in my life now where I'm, I'm thinking about that. I'm thinking about like jam and we're doing lots of activities and events that sometimes we're like, I'm a little scared to 
you know, put this on, or like, I feel like we could use some sense of safety, but like, how do we do that without involving the police? And so watching that film, learning from that archival footage, that, you know, there is another way, like we can find other forms of, of protection and like community, you know, support in that way. So I don't know, that kind of veered off from the point of the question, but archive, important, <laughs> history, you get it. <laughs> You learn things. <laughs> Thanks, Jordan. Um, no, another question that I have watching this footage was, um, and I'm not a filmmaker, so I don't quite understand what's going on here. Why these extreme close-ups of Thelonious monks? Like, down to the pores, you know, you see everything. Is that normal? Is that how you do this? Like, uh, you know, um. can somebody explain to me what's going on? <laughs> Franz Fanon, look mom, I see a black man. Um, it's, it, it's this fixation, this fixation that at its best is fetishization and at its worst is dehumanization mm. of the curiosity of this person. Um, it's the people that keep wanting to touch my hair because they're curious about the texture. Um, it's, <laughs> you know, the need to look that closely because you don't believe what you see. Interesting, yeah, and I think that really came through because when I started to watch that film, I was like, oh, this is interesting, we're getting to see archival footage, and, uh, and then more and more the discomfort comes, and it's like, hang on, I experienced that too, I don't know where and how, but it felt so familiar and so triggering, you know, to watch this, and I think every person of color, also women, probably too, when you are in a space where you're marginalized, you know, I think everybody of us has a story to tell that's quite similar <laughs> to what happened here with or without camera. So, um, and uh, that's a, a question for you, Lachelle, and maybe you can tell a little bit more what the Creative Discourse Group does. Um, you know, what are the ethical conducts of making a close portrait and close and intimate um, you know, a uh, portrait of a person or of a story, you know? Um, so I'll give you a little bit of a background on what we do, and then I'll get into your question. I think it's Speak louder, please. Oh, sorry, can you hear me? That's good. <laughs> um, um, I will tell you guys what I do with the creative discourse, and then I'll get into that question, because I thought it was interesting. It made me think of something that I learned from my a summer of acting two class, and it was this really intensive, in a space like this, um, kind of acting course. So at the Creative Discourse, um, we are a firm that does work with um, starting with nonprofits and municipalities throughout the state of uh, Vermont doing diversity, equity, and inclusion work. And so uh, we are asked to come in and basically talk about these kinds of things. Why can't I ask about the texture of your hair? I don't know um, anyone with hair like yours. I like to know a little bit more, but like, why do you want to know a little bit more? Or for me personally, a question I get a lot um, is about my hands and my nails and the way I choose to adorn them. And they're innocuous at best, yeah? But um, I guess the question is, why do you want to inquire about that? Is it because you think it's interesting, you're curious, you're, you're fascinated by the artistic um, sense of it, or is it I have this percep perception of black women who aren't from this particular region and how they choose to dress themselves and what that says about their personality and the way that they move in the world. So that's the kind of work that we're trying to get at the root of. What is your perception? Where did you get it from? And then how can we unlearn that and find ways to ask questions? Curiosity is great but making sure that those questions are coming from a genuine place of interest and sincerity. Um, the close-up shots, because that was exactly what I thought of, and I thought about the culture of Europe at the time, like there's still public zoos with black people in them at this time, right? There's conflict in Algiers, there's so much going on in France with black folks, and how that has, how that informed how they interacted with Thelonious or Nina Simone or James Baldwin. Um, and one thing that my professor always told us in scenes, if you're gonna get super close to someone, right? Like right in their face, you better do one of two things. 
hit them or kiss them. <laughs> okay? There's no other reason to be that intimate with someone in their face. And so when I saw those shots, I, I you know, I thought of them saying, uh, we want to do this the modern way, right? And mm -hmm. they're thinking, I want to get artistic shots of, of his, his physique. Um, but like, why are you so curious about his physique? And if anything, the one piece that you should probably be focused on um, is the concentration in his eyes. That's what I would have focused on. Um, and his hands, because that's the most important, that's, that's his tool in this medium, right? How does he use his hands? How does that, like they're so graceful for such large hands. And not like he's just big, burly man, but like, you know, it's just like they're, they're such large hands. Maybe they're not hands that you would normally think would play a piano, and yet he dances and glides across those keys. And I think paying attention to the technique then wouldn't have made it feel so comfortable, but we're like in his mouth, we're in his beard, we're in his crotch, just in places that like the camera had no business um, being. And so I, I feel like um, one of the big ethical pieces is why are you doing what you're doing and have you truly interrogated the purpose um, and the intent of the art that you're making, especially when you're making something that's biographical. Can I Can add I on to that? Um, yeah, I think, um, ditto to everything. Um, uh, if I've learned anything um, working here and just kind of in, in filmmaking in general on that path, like the camera is an incredibly powerful tool the camera and then also by extension like the you know the direction and the editing process just filmmaking in general very powerful and i think that more often than not it's we we should always like encourage people to like utilize that for themselves and be able to tell like their own story because like you know they they know better than anyone like why should i be doing this or what that impetus is but if you're not you know letting them do that and you are telling someone's story or making this like intimate depiction of someone, I think, in a lot of ways, right, that person that you're, that you're interviewing or whatever is giving you, like, autonomy over themselves and their story. And I think, for me, the, like, ethical question that you need to ask yourself is, like, what have I done to earn that autonomy? Like, is there trust there? Like, and how have I demonstrated it? Is there, like, a mutual respect? How have I demonstrated that? If it's like a subject or a concept that you're exploring that maybe you don't have like a per close personal like understanding or connection to, like have I done my research? Like all of these questions, I think you need to ask or you know interrogate and figure out to come to that conclusion of like, do I deserve or have I earned the right to be able to tell this person's story? That's, yeah. yeah, that makes sense, and I think it's uh, absolutely about trust. You um, you gotta trust the person behind the camera yep. to put you in the right light. Otherwise, you all of a sudden feel very exposed and very naked. And um, and I want to ask this question too: What is the power dynamic between the subject in front of the camera and the person behind the camera? And what happens if that dynamic is racialized? You know, as we have seen here. And another thing that I found really interesting, just like you know, trying to figure out reactions to this movie. And there were two reactions uh, that I've seen. It's like, one reaction was like, oh, Thelonious Monk definitely experienced racism. This was racism. And there were a lot of people who were like, oh, these people weren't racist, mostly white people who had that uh, opinion. It's like, oh, this wasn't racism. It was just tr lost in translation. And they were badly prepared, like, TV group. But it wasn't racism. They were just, like, doing their job properly. So, yeah person in front of the camera, person behind the camera, racialized dynamics. I'd be very curious, I mean, to, as a companion film, if they have the original mm. jazz portrait, because I think it is interesting, because also so much story can be told in the editing, too. And I think this is a story that the filmmaker in here was able to extract from that footage and tell really beautifully, but also with their own agenda and perspective. Okay. And so it would be interesting to contrast it. Um, because you don't even know if it was a close-up, was it a close-up that, that the editors filmed in on, or was it one shot from the raw footage? It's just fascinating. And to think about this, 
clearly Monk dealt with extraordinary amounts of racism throughout his life and the way it's fascinating to see the French uh, host talk about the history in a way like, oh, we're not going to talk about you getting paid the worst. We're not going to, we're going to skip over. Yeah, you were not active during the, the early 50s, but it doesn't talk about the fact that in New York at the time, there's this incredibly racist program called the Cabaret Card. And if you didn't have an approved Cabaret Card from the New York City Police, you couldn't gig in any New York City club. Monk had his Cabaret Card revoked on a very weak charge of marijuana possession and then couldn't work in like his livelihood was taken from him during that decade it wasn't because he was in the shadows it was because of like an active city program in new york city that was discriminatory against jazz musicians so it's interesting to think about this is what yeah what is the filmmaker's ver voice and story what is monk's voice and story what were the filmmakers intentions in france it's all a very complex mix in there um, on a side point i would just in terms of monk's history i would highly recommend if anyone's interested in his work robin dg kelly wrote this seminal biography of Thelonious monk that came out about 20 years ago um, and really what robin robin is this extraordinary um, music historian, but also labor historian and black studies historian. And so really put Monk's life in context of work, community economics, in a way that I think changed how jazz scholarship is dealt with in a really powerful way. And so I feel this, this film is very much a companion piece to that documentary in some ways, really does it in an artistic way, what Robin did in a deeply scholarly way. But um, yeah, I would just, it's interesting to put it in the context because I think it's, 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 I'm the person I know least in this, or the person whose background I know least is actually the director themselves. So I'm very curious what their interest or agenda or point or narrative was and how they were taking the footage and using it, which is, becomes the sort of, the, for me, the third artist voice perspective in this mix that's almost the most invisible, but in some ways is actually the most powerful, mm. you know? Mm. I think this idea of, of looking um, and you know, looking mediated through the lens, which is of course like what I spend so much time thinking about for photography. Um, sometimes when we say, was that racist? And people are like, that wasn't racist. That's because their idea of what is racist <coughs> is very large. It, it's writ very large. Um, versus I have certain biases about women who have their nails that look like this, women whose hair looks like this, and those biases make me think this person should be, will be, is going to behave in a certain way, and if they do, yay, I get to portray that, and if they don't, I'm gonna find a way to make it look like they did. Um, and it's just, it, it has to do with expectations of looking. Um, it's often sometimes when people go into other places when you look at war journalists and whatever and what they choose to take pictures of versus when people are making photos in their own country, in their own communities, what they choose to fixate on, um, what is seen, what is looked at. And this idea of it's not being racist and it's like, but you don't even understand the attitudes are so deeply ingrained that you don't see that's where it's coming from. Um, there are sometimes histories that have just kind of passed through your head in popular culture and you didn't even know that there's a long-term connection with those things. Um, and then when they come up, it's like, oh, you, you went there. <laughs> and someone's like, I, I, where, where? And it's like, well, here's like 200 years of problematic stuff that you didn't realize caused you to make that connection. Um, when they did the illustration of President Obama as an ape, there was 200 years of Africans as monkeys um, that was tied to that, that the illustrator didn't think he was participating in. Um, but it was, it was there. And it's, it's some of those layers of things that come into that type of looking um, that make that decision on what the actual racialized dynamics are. And sometimes it's easier to use terms like racialized dynamics because it doesn't sound as accusatory. Um, but that's what it is. It, it's who has had the right to look and who has had the right to determine what that looking means and then how that then comes out to our understanding of what we see. 
and I, so much of that is happening here. I also, like, while I was watching this, I kept thinking there's an interview with um, Jean-Michel Basquiat, um, and the interviewer is doing similar things. And much like the way <coughs> Monk used the songs at the end, <laughs> Basquiat starts playing with him, and the, the, the interviewer never realizes he's being played with. Um, and other people are watching it and are like, oh, God, he's, he's being very sarcastic and making fun of your question. Um, and the interviewer just keeps going because he's you know, asking this in all earnestness. Um, but it's a very negatively racialized comment that he's made, and Basquiat plays off of that, like, oh, you expect me to be this. Okay, here's my answer. Um, and, and Monk is doing that same Thing, and I'm like, there's this frustration, and then you play off of it in a way that people who know will know. <laughs> and so it's like, oh yeah, I've, I've heard them ask that, and I wanted to say the same thing, <laughs> but they still don't even hear what I'm saying to them, but the other people will hear it. And I think that's the thing, like, especially other black jazz musicians saw that and heard what he played and probably cackled. Um, I think if they had really realized what he was doing, they would have asked him to play different songs. <laughs> They've been like, cut that out. <laughs> yeah, it's not very nice. That's not nice. That's not, nice. That's not very nice. <laughs> exactly. Let's talk about gaslighting then. Mm. Yeah. I mean, like, there are ways, uh, you know, to tell the Thelonious Monk it's not very nice to tell his story that he's been brought over and given no resources. That's, that's, I think we all can agree that's gaslighting, right? And um, I don't see it as much as gaslighting as tone policing. Mm. Tone policing, interesting. Because yeah, like, they don't tell them it didn't happen. Like, oh, well, I'm sure you, like, they just didn't have musicians. This, like, it wasn't, this didn't happen. Or maybe you did, you know, I'm sure there was someone who got paid less than you. It's like, well, don't say it that way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, better don't say it at all. Right. No, but then tone policing, gaslighting, can we parse this apart a little bit? Well, uh, just so we're all on the same page when it comes to definitions. Where did we see gaslighting in that film? And we just talked about tone policing. Um, I think it's like all of the things at once. <laughs> it, like I also saw it as revisionist and like a in real time whitewashing of yes. that event. Um, that if we never saw this, right, and no one else did any deep diving work, you would just be like, okay, yeah, that's what happened. No, it didn't happen that way. He was already on the bill, so clearly he was taken care of. Um, and so I feel like um, I feel like there was gaslighting in them being like, no, 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 like, well, that's not nice. Like, you were there, though, right? Like, you got to participate. You were on the cover. Everyone was coming to see you. Everyone else was a supporter. Um, but in reality, you couldn't get musicians. No one wanted to play with him. Um, they did a thing which is coming up in conversations more and more for award shows with a lot of black creatives and artists and Latin artists and Asian artists where they put them on the bill because they want everyone, the viewership to like rise up. So Beyonce is gonna be there, all right? Viewership's gonna go up 70%, um, but that's it. We're gonna nominate these folks for tons of things, but we're not actually going to reward the work that they do. Um, kind of in the way, you know, of, of wanting to support black artists but then not wanting to pay them for their work. Yes. Um, and so I think there was gaslighting there. I think there's definitely the tone policing of that's not nice. Don't say that. They talked to him like he was a child, like they were kind of coddling him. I think that's another viewpoint the lens gives of like, look at this person playing this, um, uh, this transcendent music. Like, how is this body producing this? Um, and I think that there's the revisionist piece. Like they were going to in that moment, or they did in that moment say, we're gonna cut that, we're not gonna talk about that, and then I'm gonna do a voiceover and tell you what the experience was like. So this way it's all wrapped up neatly in a bow. Um, and I think that is, there was something about that that just felt a little too real. <laughs> um, and to retreat to life and just everyday average experiences. Uh, and I think it's a really great example for folks who don't understand the nuances of those three different things to see it all at once. Yeah, I just like to 
Just let me collect my thought. Like, the way that, yeah, the way that it was, one, when you said revisionist, that right on the mark, and it, it felt crazy to watch that happen, like, live, like him just be like, this is actually what, I'm going to rephrase everything you said, it, but say it in a way that's acceptable, and we're just going to, the whole thing was giving, like, dance, monkey and dance, you know what I mean? I, I'm if just, I ask the question twice, you'll say it differently the next time. <laughs> and he's like, I'm going to say the same <laughs> thing. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't pay me. Like, and, 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 and it is it is crazy, and it was a perfect example, like, what the the story he shared about, like, yeah, they brought me out to France, they put me on the covers, but then like they didn't do anything to support me. It, it just, it was also, I feel like, exemplified in that actual interview because it was like they were doing all the right things, kind of like they're talking the talk. They're like, yeah, he's this exemplary artist of our times. And they made sure to like, you know, say what they need to say to, to be, because, you know, this is this, you know, monumentous figure in jazz, but they're not. You know, they're talking the talk, but they're not walking the walk. They're going to say that they care and that this person is amazing, but we're watching them treat him otherwise directly. You know what I mean? So it's, it's it, yeah, it's it's just a continuance right now of the same way that people love to say we support black artists. Or, like, my, my favorite thing is, like, there are... <laughs> I saw, like, a tweet, and it was a, a barbershop or, like, a, a hair salon in... I think it was... I think it was Portland, and it, you know, it said like Black Lives Matter flags and all these things in the fist. And then someone went in there to try and get a haircut, and they're like, "We don't cut black hair. We don't know how." And it's just like, like <laughs> I just and yeah, it, virtue signaling. It kind of felt like to me, yeah, with the classical music too. Yeah. When so when he kept going back to, tell us how you you know you started playing with classical music, and he's like, no. I taught myself how to play, but then when I wanted to read music, they, use, they only use classical <laughs> music to teach you how to read music, so I had no choice but to do this. And then later when he talks about how he, as a child, that Thelonious Monk grew up listening to these other pianists, these other black pianists who played with their left hand, in a certain way with their left hand, and how that's how he plays, that's clearly where like his learning comes from as he was teaching himself to play, but then when he translates it, he doesn't translate that he taught himself how to play the piano. Right. He just translates, he learned how to read music, and of course this was done with classical music. And I was watching that and I'm like, what happened to the part about him <laughs> teaching himself how to play? Where did that go? Um, as it was happening, I'm like, you just refuse to admit that this man learned to be a great musician without starting with European classical music, mm. that that could that that was not his foundation, um, and they, he just was not going to admit that to a French audience. It's <laughs> not nice. Well, I think it's an important thing to point out about Monk too in his music. He, he challenges all the preconceptions of what music, uh, what a composer is supposed to be, what a musical genius is supposed to be. He reframes it in this incredible way because. He, it's interesting, if you look at Monk, he really only wrote 70 compositions in his life, and all those compositions are from 12 to 36 measures long. I mean, he really, but took these, from these little fragments of ideas, he built an entire vocabulary, an entire improvisational aesthetic, an entire approach that while, he, and they talk about him emerging from the bebop era, of being avant-garde, of doing all those things, but ultimately is unclassifiable in any kind of genre, any kind of thing, and particularly, when you look at the commodification of an artist and art and trying to, okay, we have to define it in this way to sell it. And Monk's work so resisted any kind of definition like that and so exploded the sort of Eurocentric concept of what a composer is, you know, as opposed to being like, oh, you put down music on paper and then it's realized by other people. Monk's thing was like, he created an incredibly inimitable sound world. And we all play Thelonious Monk compositions and none of us can sound like Thelonious Monk, you know? And we all like revere his music. Like he's one of the few people that all factions of this kind of improvised music world hold in high esteem because he doesn't fit in any of them. And that kind of, yet that individuality is also coming from a collective practice drawing upon the community that he built from. He was always about his neighborhood. He was always about his closest friends. And again, all of those 
aspects of his biography for me are such an extraordinary challenge to the sort of very hierarchical sort of genius composer notion that is at the basis of all sort of Western European art music. And so I think you can see that tension played out in very real time in that moment because there's almost this refusal to admit that someone could conceptualize something so radically, uh, not antithetical, but such a radical change, evolution, manifestation, you know, in this moment. And I think that it's one of those things I feel it's with a lot of these figures, I think it's like, oh, they're the greatest jazz, one of the great jazz composers of the 20th century. And I feel like that ultimately ends up being such a dismissive thing. Like, no, this is one of the greatest, like, artistic minds of the 20th century. It's a very different thing, but it's, but again, by putting it in the jazz category, by putting it in the sense of this sort of sweaty player, you know, dripping over the piano, D, yeah, is a larger process of like, cool, we'll acknowledge your greatness as long as you fit into the category we predetermined for you. Mm -hmm. But his monk's whole thing was, as Ellington always say, just beyond category and, and exploding that sense that you can be processed and commodified and fit into a category. And that for me is one of the, again, where I think he says more in the 20 minutes of just playing than anyone else can say in all of their interviews and all of their things and all of their stuff, you know? That's a great perspective, and I think, you know, talking about that, his 20 minutes of playing and creating his, being in his own world, um, you all are artists in your own right, or you're working with artists, so uh, I wanted to know, how do you negotiate your power and maintain your composure in an unfamiliar place, or even in a hostile, in a hostile space? Because clearly, I was impressed how Thelonious Monk was, like, keeping his composure. <laughs> I don't think I could have done it. It's, you know, it, it leads me back to something that I also kept questioning while I was watching the movie. The interviewer talks about their personal relationship, that he has spent a lot of time with him, that he's been in his home frequently. And I'm like, so if you guys have this relationship, why are you being such an ass? <laughs> <laughs> like, this did not come across as someone's friend talking to them. Um, and I, th I think he was also somewhat frustrated by what was happening in the studio. There were times when you like put both arms on the piano and do it this way and do it that way, but there was there was just this lack of camaraderie between them, this lack of intimacy. Um, and I think that that kind of speaks sometimes to being in those spaces of this understanding that you are in a space that isn't built for you and you learn how to fit in that box for the time. Um, it's very nice to get out and stretch once in a while. Um, but that you, you sort of play into it until you can like bump an elbow here and there and get it to fit a, a bit more. Um, I mean, that's, that's a lot of the work that I'm doing. It's a lot of the work that you do directly. Um, sounds like the work that you're doing where we're all trying to get these spaces to give a little, if not a lot. Um, by bringing in something else that's that's not going to comfortably fit in in the shape that the space is already in, um, but you but to climb into them to to squeeze those spaces out, you, you have to get in the box first. Um, I did love that like monk periodically was like I'm out and just got <laughs> up and was about to leave, and he had to come back. Um, I also noticed how much he kept trying to get the other man to stop touching him <laughs> when he was trying to get him to come back in. Like stop yeah. putting your hands on me, in in m me trying to take some of my autonomy back and and leave this negative environment, um, which I think also comes down to it is this like right to touch again. Um, and so those things in, in traversing those spaces. Um, but again, it's practice. Practice, practice, practice. Uh, um, so, which, you know, this isn't the first time from when he showed up in 54 and had to deal with how France was going to treat him. It's now 69. He's had 15 years of Europeans being Europeans at him, along with a whole lifetime of being in the US it is not acceptable if he wants to ever work again to be a black man that gets loud and angry. That's not allowed. And he knows it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it, it's, it's practice, but it's also kind of just like, 
intrinsic in a lot of ways. Like you were kind of raised to know how to navigate those situations. You know, you're taught how to how to be in white spaces and how to, you know, depending on who you are, where you're from, like there's a certain degree of just like needing, it's like a, like a survival mechanism almost. But what, what was really resonant to me is that like, he, he did handle it very well, but like, kind of like you said before, for those who know, you know, like the fate, like I was like, yeah, that phase, mm -hmm. I've made that phase. Like, I, like that is me, I've been in that situation and like you can like, I don't know, there's just something very, like it seems like he's handling it well and he's putting on a good show, but like you can see it in his eyes. <laughs> or like, yeah, I don't know. I think it's also, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, thank you. I said there's, there's also a way that I think he uses the music itself mm -hmm. in a way that I find very uh, uh, powerful. It's, um, there's two things that made me think of that. There's one old, I think it was, well, three lines. There's one old classic musician line is, I play music for free, I get paid to travel. Um, and that can almost be, especially in this context, be transformed to like, I, I play music for free, I get paid to pull up with all of this, <laughs> you know, all of this stuff. Um, there's also, I remember there was a line, I think, by Miles Davis once where I was talking about drug use and jazz, where he's like, no, I never use drugs to play music. I use drugs for when I wasn't playing music. Mm -hmm because that's when I needed some help, you know? And you could see whenever Monk could just get to them, like, I have to say also as a musician, there's just the stuff of watching Monk noodle. On the piano. I would pay to watch 10 hours of Monk just noodling on the piano, because what he was doing was fascinating. And then he would sit, and, and is actually quite different than his recorded performances, because you could see he was doing this for his own interest, learning this piano, hearing a different chord, see his touch, I mean, you talk about watching his fingers, Musically, you can't underestimate what Monk could get sounds out of the piano with the control, way, the way he kind of mastered overtones, the way he clumped the, the, these cluster chords, these dissonances, so-called so distant dissonances. And you could see him explore, okay, what does this piano give me? What can I get? So like, there's all this bullshit going around, I'm just gonna hit this chord three times and really listen to it and get inside of it. And it reminded me when I used to play in Cecil Taylor's band, who was a pianist who was hugely influenced by Monk. Um, who came up as like a gay avant-gardist in the 1950s, so dealt with a lot of bullshit too. But we would sometimes do soundtracks where the music would happen in the soundtrack. If the music was real, it would happen, and if the presenter was being an asshole, we'd play a 10-minute set. <laughs> you know, and it'd be like, the music had the right to happen, and whenever the music was real, it's a spiritual, powerful place, and that's the real thing. And that's on our, like, that's on the musician's time frame. And then if the presenter's being an asshole, cool, we'll do something, you know, you're paid us to get here, you have the power, we gotta be nice to you, we're gonna be friendly, we'll even invite you over to our house for a cup of coffee, and you'll think you're our buddy, because we need the gig, but ultimately, we're making the music for ourselves. And I think, for me, I could so see Monk using the music to be like, um, I got my chord, <laughs> you know? And I can get through this day if I can keep, you know, stay connected to the sound. And that, for me, felt very, that was a, a very palpable passage throughout this film. Artist in Refuge. Yeah. I loved him using the music as a way to basically poke back. Um, in my own personal life, outside of the work, I've been thinking about this a lot um, because there are many times in my life where I had to fit in a very particular kind of box and wear a very particular literal uniform and these different kinds of things. Um, and so I decided that for me, what that will be or look like is just being ditzy. Because I, 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 I had a, a mentor in my life that I've, I've known, they're like a second mom to me, and I was talking to them about something last year. I was really frustrated because it had to do with this kind of topic. Like, I will say, I've never talked about race and gender so much in my life <laughs> until I moved to Vermont. Um, and, 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 I, and I'm not saying I never did, I've just never, it, it, I've never had to talk about it in such an elementary way. Um, mm -hmm. And um, it's, it's, it's so dehumanizing to do in your personal life, in your professional work, and it's even, and what makes it so dehumanizing is the, what feels like a, a lack of willingness to understand. Um, and so I've decided I'm going to be ditzy. I know I'm smart. <laughs> I know I, I, I know things and that I'm skillful. I know that I may have only been here for 33 years, but I've lived quite a lot of life in those 33 years and that it's just as valuable as someone 66. 
Um, and so I found that in those moments, I just click that little piece on, and it's, it's, it, it at least um, gives me some relief in the moment um, until I can presence myself to get back into the conversation and, and, and steer the conversation where I want it to go. Um, I was thinking about when you're talking about the hands. There's a scene in uh, the film Pacific Rim with, between um, Idris Elba and Charlie Hunan, and Charlie um, touches him and it's not rehearsed. And he turns around and gives him this look like, I, you better be happy we're on this set right now <laughs> because I wasn't expecting that and um, a different me was going to react until I remembered what we were doing. And then the way he like shifted that into his line and just, it was just a look of like, how dare you touch me? Here's my line and I'm done with the scene. <laughs> and I feel like that is just how sometimes I have to um, move in this world. Kind of like, how dare you challenge me? This is who I am if you weren't acquainted with me before. And I'm just gonna step away for a little bit. Um, because I'd like to say that I am handling it well. But I don't wanna handle it well. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. I don't, I just you don't you don't want to become perfect in being not yourself you know surviving a space right that's yeah. that's not fair that doesn't feel right it doesn't feel good at all and uh, here's also my last question then you know on that what can white people do and what do white people need to know who uh, dominate the spaces institutions and organizations um, you know and and who then want to invite people of color into their spaces to perform or you be participate in that. What do white institution needs to know? How to make this all a little bit better and to avoid situations like this? You know, what, what can be done? What are you trying to do as teachers and, and you know, cultural workers? My off the cuff response is just hire black people, but I will think of a more of a, or I'll, we'll come back. I'll have more to say, but that, that's the first way I feel like to make these spaces open or like more inclusive or like like a lot of people are very good about kind of saying like this is a safe space, this is an inclusive space, but then don't put in any of the work to actually uh, realize that. Um, and yeah, I'll, that's a good question. I'll think about you know other things, but hiring black people will make black people more comfortable. I'll tell you that. That's easy. Also, say hiring on leadership and not yeah. just on the posters. Person. And on like, put them in charge facing. of I making the space. Because I can't tell how many presenters or festivals or film, film crews that I've met who want to say they are supporting you know, black music and their festival and the programming is very diverse, but the leadership structure and their curatorial team mm -hmm. and the, is not. Mm -hmm. And I think, especially, and you see that in Europe, and that's part of the European complicated relationship with this music because also I mean because also to give Europe credit this jazz would not have survived without Europe support America has been I mean we think that's like at least monk got on a TV show in Paris he wasn't even you know I mean there was there the lack of any ex outside of the little window in the Cold War where we needed to prove that we were better than the commies so we support cool music over like that's when Armstrong and Gillespie and Ellington the only time they ever received government support from the US was to tour and represent that, that, you know, when the State Department tours to show that we are different than, you know, we have free expression in the U.S., but you can't go home and get a gig. And I think that that dynamic has been deep. So making sure that it's part of changing a culture and an organization on, a, in, in, on an inside level and not just the window dressing. For me, um, in doing the work, I am and I know that this makes everyone really uncomfortable, but we're all just gonna have to be uncomfortable together. Um, I challenge you to sit in what makes you uncomfortable. I challenge you to interrogate your thoughts. I am not this person because I just like came out the womb this way in a different world without all of this, probably. But there was a lot of internalized hatred and anti-blackness and xenophobia and ethnophobia. So many things that you have to unlearn when you've grown up in a system that indoctrinates you. Um, so 
if I can do it while simultaneously having to deal with the oppression of it all, then I think that it should be easier for you to be able to sit in that uncomfortableness and sit in that fear and sit in um, the disgust that that will bring you when you realize, oh my goodness, I used to lock my doors every time I saw a person of color thinking that like I was just locking my doors and not that like someone taught me that when I'm in a specific neighborhood and I see somebody that I should lock my doors. Um, I, um, you know, talked about this food in a particular way, completely disregarding that this is someone's entire culture, um, and it's what they eat, and it's what it's it's McDonald's to them. <laughs> um, I think that um, we have tried to tackle this work in a myriad of ways, and I think now we're at the space where it's literally up to the individual. It doesn't matter how much collective trainings we go to and books we read. Um, it's up to you. If you're not internalizing what you're learning and then applying it to your everyday real world experience, then how are you going to expect change to happen, right? Um, so I challenge white folks in particular to sit with the discomfort because we've all sat with the discomfort. We have to, we don't have a choice because we have to live in this duality that we didn't ask for. So sit with it. And yeah, you're gonna look in the mirror and be like, I hate you, you're gross. And that's okay, because that's how you evolve and that's how you grow. Um, there's so many things I've said, a younger me has said that I'm like, why would I ever say that? What was I thinking? That's not even how I really felt in the time, but it's, I had to perform a certain being to survive. Um, and I'll leave you with this thought of this performance artist I saw my senior year who at the time uh, was 40 and he was talking about his 20s and he was like some people say um, that if you contradict yourself then that like is a problem right but I think that you should contradict yourself because who you are today isn't who you was yesterday and it's not who you're gonna be tomorrow right um, and so be comfortable with the fact that yeah, you now is going to contradict what you thought at 25 or 35 or 10. And that's okay because that's evolution and growth in your life. Well, that's a lot to follow. Uh, <laughs> um, and right on every point. Um, but I will also say, just to bring it back to the institution, I so often have conversations in groups and with institutions about, but we're so friendly to everyone. When they come in here, we are friendly to everyone. And I'm like, okay, but what have you done to let people know that it's safe to come in the door? It's fine to be friendly once people are in your door, but if you are an institution that has traditionally been unwelcoming to people, not letting them know that there is anything that has changed about you, that there is a reason why they should feel safe there, they're not going to walk through that door and you can continue feeling like you are being productive by being friendly to everyone who does while you are still effectively shutting a lot of people out. So you really need to think of who you are and how you're letting who you are be known to know that people can walk through the door. Thank you all. Um, I don't know, Jordan, do we have time for questions? Or are we out of time? No. Uh, what time is it? 2.19. 2 I think if yeah. we can take a few audience okay. questions. A few Anyone audience questions. Hi, I'm a jazz musician, and I'm <clears throat> in my 70s, so. I was in high school and college in the 60s, and I bought a lot of Thelonious Monk records back then. And uh, so thinking about the historical presentation of this, one aside, what you had said about uh, the uh, uh, ignoring, ignoring what Thelonious Monk had said, and then he gave, us, gave a story about, uh, about Monk keeping playing during a riot in Mintons or whatever, which I think might have been Mintons, when there was a fire going on and fights and stuff like that, and Minton 
they completely broke it up and met and said there was no, uh, Meng, uh, Mengus, uh, Monk said there was no reason to stop playing. But that's, music was his refuge, right? He kept playing during the interview. And the same, same thing we were talking about earlier. But the historical television treatment of musical performances, whether it's symphonies, jazz musicians, rock and roll, the video people, cameras, always focus in on specific things on people. In this movie, and this movie that's re-envisioned re from 53 years ago, uh, who knows what the final product was? But he just, this, this director put a lot of that stuff with the close-ups of the beard and the eyes. And who knows what the final product would have been, as, as uh, Taylor said. Ted. So the most interesting thing of the whole thing about Monk's performance was that when they showed his feet for about 15 seconds, tapping his foot, moving it back and forth to the pedal and back on that kind of rhythmic piece. Anyway, but I, I thought historically, the context, if you've ever watched any TV shows where they focus in on jazz musicians that were recorded in the 50s and 60s, they do that a lot, they focus in. Because the directors aren't musicians, but they figure, oh, this is interesting, I'll get in on the hands, I'll get in on the face. And so, it wasn't that unusual to do that. As a filmmaker and a white person <laughs> and a mother of a black child um, and an appreciative music lover of every genre, jazz is the manifestation of filmmaking and filmmaking is the manifestation of jazz. The two of them are like these two, these two constructs live inside of each other in a most perfect way. And they are imperfect in every regard, as is our evolution, as is our struggle with one another on this planet. Because it's really hard, and I agree with you. We have to sit in our own discomfort because we deserve it. And it's not even our fault all the time because it's unconsciously taught and incorporated into our lives historically. And it's sad, and it's painful, and it's difficult. And films like this are so necessary. And festivals that lay claim to exploding our ability to see these kinds of films are so necessary. And communities like this are so necessary. So. There's a lot to appreciate, and there's a lot to um, be overwhelmed by, uh, and that's it, you know? That's like life. <laughs> like, it's like, did you see the movie EO? I don't know if you know about it. It's about, it's made by a Eastern European filmmaker, made one film, made another film 60 years later, it went to Cannes, whatever. It's about a donkey, literally. And, you know, the donkey escapes from a, a, a circus and tries to find, like, takes this crazy journey. And, you know, you just want the donkey to wind up in a field of daisies and be happy. And in the end, it winds up on a trough going into a sausage factory. And, like, it's like life is just like you appreciate the good stuff when you have it in front of you, and then you take what comes and you do your very best with every note. And that's exactly what I thought of this film. So thank you all for your input. It was awesome. I have to go. <laughs> thank you very much. Hi, my name's Tom. And uh, just for a background, uh, I manage uh, an acoustic black blues artist, uh, Guy Davis, who is the son of Ossie Davis and Ruby Dee. And um, I can tell you, number one, that nothing has changed in France. We've been on TV shows. And so <laughs> as early as a year ago in May, uh, nothing has changed. Uh, there is a great deal of 
in France anyway that we found. Unlike where other countries we've gone to, there seems to be an ingrained passive aggressiveness in, in their form of racism. Um, so far be it for me to defend the French. Um, I'm a little surprised as a photography curator that um, the way I saw the film, and I can appreciate your guys' point of view, but the way I saw the film, knowing the time it was shot, that's a very, that was a very famous and still used technique of, of uh, it's called French cropping, where you're zooming in uh, a lot. In fact, I found the most interesting shot of the whole film was where his eye was in the upper right-hand corner. And so... And, and had he just been using that French cropping around his hands and around his, like, with that eye moment and the feet, it's, it's not the technique of cropping. It's what they chose to crop and fixate on. That was my commentary okay. as, as, a, as a photo curator. But, for example, I saw them pan down, and I, what I saw in the shot was when he panned down, I think he was trying... the cameraman who is not the director he's just a cameraman uh, I think he was going for the ring on his hand and then I think what I saw was he very quickly said oh shoot I'm shooting his crotch I better <laughs> get back up um, but that, that's not the point I, one of the, th the points I really wanted to ask about and I, I, wa I apologize I walked in five minutes late so I don't know if, what commentary was made at the start of the film on film or in, in the introduction uh, I'm curious because I can guarantee you that he didn't make a dime being on that show in 1969, uh, whether or not the Monk Estate cooperated in this film and whether the Monk Estate is a part of uh, this film uh, in, in, in any success it has. But does, we don't have a filmmaker here, so maybe none of you actually have the... the, the well, no, no, no. I didn't uh, work uh, on this, this movie. <laughs> of, uh, we don't have the filmmaker no. here or anyone from the film here, so I don't know if we have the answer to that question. But that's, that was my most, that was the thing I saw the most. I said, is this a second round of exploitation of Thelonious Monk, or is this the first round of. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, obviously I, I can't speak to that, but what, what you said was something that I was grappling with while watching it as like a, a videographer. Like, I. It's interesting because, like, this film is, it's been in so many iterations, and filmmaking is, like that woman said, like, it is jazz, it's kind of improvisational, and you're constantly kind of changing the meaning of what you're seeing with every edit, with every cut, with every choice you're making. And, like, as a videographer, right, sometimes I will just for, like, the artistry, you know, maybe want to, like, get a weird out-of-context shot, or I'm like, ooh, that looks pretty, and I'm getting a bunch of stuff, but then there's, like, the second layer of how I choose to then, like, use that, and, and, and what we don't know, like you said, like, is what were the choices that were made by the original, like, French um, team that did this, like, what were, you know, we, we're just getting footage, like, we don't know what the cameraman's like purview was, what the director then told them, and then what this uh, Gomez, um, the director of the film we just watched, like what was his input? And like there's just so many layers where the meaning could have been skewed or changed, whether that's like intentionally or not, but I don't know. Well, you know the, the fact is that every story, there's three versions of the story. Yeah. There's your point of view, yeah. there's my point of view, and there's the truth, <laughs> and yeah. so, you know, for, I'll give you a little example. When uh, there, I respect everyone's point of view on the on the observation that he didn't get paid and he didn't have the musicians, I've had experiences where my my artist will show up, and they're like, "You didn't bring a PA, PA system with you." It's just a, a, a an assume an assumption is made, and so, and I'm, again, I'm not defending the French, but um, the the. Uh, point of him going there and then there's no musicians for him, it may not have been communicated. It could have been that, that um, the French made an assumption, well, of course, it's the loneliest monk and his band is going to come and then he shows up and he's there and there's no musicians for him. So there's that point of view that happens a lot in the music business where there's assumptions made. And again, I'm not, I don't know, I wasn't there. Uh, I was 11 years old. Uh, and, and so... Um, it's just, it's how you take a point of view on it, and it's easy for us to all observe the point of view uh, from each of our perspectives. And so my perspective as a music business person is that 
when I heard him say that there was no musician there, one thought I had was, yeah, of course, they were screwing you. But my other point of view is maybe they weren't. They, maybe it was just a dumb mistake of assumptions being made. And so I, I think it's important for all of us to take a look and say, it's easy for us to critique and, and, and give our point of view from our perspective, as long as we're open to all the perspectives. I, I want to challenge this, since that's my thing. Um, I, um, my mom would always say, um, assumptions make an ass out of you and me, right? Oh. And um, I think that in the context of this conversation, in the context of what we've seen in the film, um, in the context of lived experience doing this work and archiving this work and, and being on both sides of the performance piece, right? I think, I think there's enough knowledge here in that space. Um, in the context of this, from our lived experience, we can guarantee you that that is what's happening. And I understand how that is difficult to receive and process when you are, when you look like the person that we're critiquing, right? Um, what I hope you take from this experience is when you start to not in defense of, in defense of, explain away or make justifications for things that you turn that voice off for a little bit and sit in the space of, but what if it is? What if it is racist? What if they were looking at him like he was a creature in a cage? What does that mean? Then ask yourself, what does that mean if I, if my first inclination before really thinking about it and interrogating it, I defend it? And then is this how I interact in spaces with folks of color that I think are my friends and colleagues and children and partners? Whether you believe it's racist or not, does it make it any less racist? And whether it was standard for the time, does it make it any better, right? We don't do that. We're, we're having a conversation about that right now, which means that like, we clearly feel that there is a, there's a problem there that needs to be shifted and, or changed or fixed. So I think that all opinions are valid in this space, right? Everyone's coming from their own lived perspective and, and lived experience. And so to you, yeah, absolutely. That makes, you can think of a million ways of why maybe that isn't what was actually happening. Um, but when you have to live in that nuance and you live in that gray and you're constantly being told, no, maybe not, I don't think so. Um, I can, I, I feel like I can speak for everyone. We can confirm, yes, that's, that's exactly what is happening in this film. I mean, they're not even talking to and, them. And if, and if even like overexemplified by the fact that immediately the interviewer was like, like, act, like you can't, you know, like don't, don't talk about that. Maybe that's even more like the point of the, exactly. like the, the revisionist yeah. of like, yeah, that might be your experience, but like, it doesn't matter, like that's not what, it's, it's not nice. Like we can't, we, the organization that supported you, you have to, you know, be on your, like don't bite the hand that feeds you essentially. And I think that speaks to exactly like, like yeah, that, that was what the experience was, but we can't, we can't talk about that, yeah. And then how you parse it apart, you know, if this racism is already there, how is it not in the gaze, in the camera then, you know? It's like, if, if that is already, underlying if that is like the flavor of the whole situation it's not you don't be like oh they're only being racist over here but they're not going to be racist over there that doesn't make that's not logic you know but thank you for your comment and thank you for our panelists today <laughs> for <laughs> this amazing discussion and um yeah well, we can go on for hours but i think <laughs> it was really enriching so thank, thank you all you for tomorrow. thank you tomorrow for inviting tomorrow. us all yeah, yeah.